So I'm going to get started because we really are going to try and keep to our 45 minutes. Um, welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us. I wanted to start by acknowledging that um, many of us are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I invite you, if you are joining us from somewhere outside of uh, the city of Vancouver and you are on an, a different Indigenous territory, um, to record that in the chat. Um, so why we're here, the purpose for today is uh, to talk about the last year as part of our rollout of the annual report this year and um, the AGM that we held last night and also um, to touch base and to let you know what we're doing and what we're up to. A little housekeeping piece, we are recording this session. And so if you don't consent to the possibility of your face showing on the recording, now is a good time to turn off, of, uh, turn off your video feed. Um, but we are um, going to record this so that we can share parts of it on social media and have it for our records. So uh, exactly one year ago, COVID-19 and uh, the global pandemic upended our world, forcing us to change the way that we operate and serve our community. On this anniversary, we wanted to thank you and invite you to break bread with us virtually as we look back on the lessons learned and how we've grown. So Toast Talks is going to be part of an ongoing series. We'd like to offer our wider community to hear information about First United, keep you engaged with the issues in the downtown east side, and be inspired about our work. Um, we will do a lot of presentations, so I'll talk for a little bit, then George Flett, our shelter manager, will talk for a little bit. Um, but sort of as uh, an engagement and having a wider conversation, we invite you to enter into the chat box if you're able what you have learned this year. Uh, as I said, we won't be here longer than 45 minutes. I'm going to share some highlights uh, from my perspective and invite George um, to share his reflections. And we want to save time at the end for your questions. Uh, but since we're reflecting on what I've learned, um, what we've learned, uh, we wanted you to to share with us what you've learned. Uh, for instance, we've heard so many people learn to bake bread and especially sourdough during the quarantine, hence a bit of a bread theme for our talks. And we'll collect your responses and maybe share them on our social media, but we will keep them anonymous. So I'd like to start by giving a toast to all of you for joining us today and being with us on our journey to serve the downtown east side. I heard it's bad luck to toast and then put your glass down without drinking. Um, so early in 2020 feels like another lifetime in a different world. We had so many plans for connecting, gathering, and togetherness. Last year's Robin Jubilee Lecture Series had just finished up, featuring Stefan Corvo to discuss housing as a human right. We had planned to visit different communities of faith throughout the Lower Mainland to speak about our shared vision of bringing sanctuary and justice to the downtown east side. Being present in and with our communities is central to our work at First United and 2020 had promised to be a year of connection. When the COVID-19 pandemic became real, we knew we had to pivot to support our community members in the downtown east side and our staff. We knew we couldn't simply shut down. Those that we serve rely on our services, sometimes for survival, food, shelter, safety, and justice. We've been fortunate but not untouched by the pandemic and we've had no community spread either with our staff or with our residents that we know of. Four of our staff contracted COVID outside of work and sadly we lost our longtime staffer Rafael Sanchez in housing to COVID in October last fall. Collectively, we rose to the challenge. We began serving meals through service windows installed on the Hastings Street front steps. We created self-isolation spaces within the shelter in case residents became symptomatic. We limited our drop-in space to shelter residents while ensuring that toiletries, mail, socks, our tax clinic, and other essential items could be accessed at the front door by those who needed them. And we feel a deep sense of pride for how our team persevered in, this, in the face of hardship and certainly um, in the face of hardship and uncertainty to, to do the thing we love to do best, which is to help. Um, in terms of my own personal perspective about the last year, uh, the first thing was just the fear, uh, the fear of the most vulnerable being affected and also having to confront internally in ourselves and in wider society, the stigmatization of poverty and homelessness and uh, reminding people that we needed to protect the downtown east side from COVID. People weren't going to get COVID from the homeless, they were going to give COVID to the homeless and that could be disastrous for this community. 
Um, we've seen how disproportionate COVID is on our community members, uh, the absence of just soap and water, public restrooms, the ability to physical distance or self-isolate. And really um, early on in the pandemic, um, the instructions around public health were centered around the wide majority of people who are homed and do have access to those things. And um, we would continually ask, well, what happens if you don't have a place to self-isolate? What happens if you can't physically distance? What happens if you don't have access to water and soap? And they would just keep sending us the same information over and over again. So our central focus early on really became on calming the community and calming staff. Um, we had a lot of uncertainty around personal protective equipment. You know, everybody knows the term PPE now. <laughs> Um, our need for it and trying to get it. Um, long before Dr. Henry had endorsed the idea of homemade cloth masks, I had been watching things with the World Health Organization and, and responses in Europe and um, put a call out to congregations to make cloth masks if that was the very best we could do. And we had congregations and individuals send them to us by the hundreds. We um, were able to share the cloth masks uh, with our housing residents because they have access to laundry and with our staff if that's what they would prefer rather than the plastic surgical masks. And we were so very grateful to John Coulter, a very active member at University Hill Congregation. If you know John through former Presbytery or from U Hill, he works in the medical supply industry and was able to source um, an initial 10,000 masks for us just before the province took over the supply chain. And so um, that really, really uh, set us in good footing until the global supply chain kind of got sorted out and it became easier to order things on our own. Um, we were we had so many that we were able to loan some to other organizations and, and that's part of how we work in the downtown east side is that everybody collectively pulls together to support the community. Um, another hard thing was the additional trauma of not being able to respond to the community needs. So walking past and seeing the increased numbers of people on the street and um, knowing that some of those folks, their, their place of choice during the day was to come to First United and be part of our drop-in and uh, not being able to safely offer that to the community. Um, one of the hardest things about being street homeless is having nowhere comfortable to sit during the day. You're always on concrete or on benches if they're available and you're not asked to move along. And um, so it was really hard. Uh, and George will probably talk about that a little bit later on our staff having to learn to say no where often, so often we strive to say yes. And then um, not being able to respond to overdoses without paramedics who are in full PPE. So um, if you know anything about the opioid overdose crisis, one of the most important uh, medical responses is to administer breaths. So, you know, when you do CPR, you alternate between compressions and breaths. Um, the breaths are most important because your heart keeps beating, but your breathing stops. And so you can cause brain damage um, from not having enough oxygen get to your brain. And of course, even with a face shield, they couldn't guarantee early on that we wouldn't have transmission of COVID. And so we were instructed no longer to give breaths and simply to administer Narcan or Naloxone and, um, and then wait for paramedics to arrive um, so that they could properly intubate people and give them breaths that way. And um, that was really hard on our staff who are, who've become quite competent, um, sadly, in responding to the overdose crisis. And then just having to pivot our work environment um, you know, making sure that during times of uh, our lockdown last spring that people who could work from home had to work from home and getting, you know, not everybody had laptops and trying to get all of that sorted out. So um, those are just some of the things that faced us uh, last year. But I want to read you a story. We pride ourselves on being able to provide immediate care while also keeping our eyes on systemic change. We know that to make the greatest impact, we must address injustices from both sides, immediate need and social change. And this is foundational to how First United has always been, will grow and ultimately achieve our vision of a neighborhood where every person can thrive. A few years ago, Herb, this is Herb on the screen, was released from prison after 30 years inside. He found himself at 67, dropped in Vancouver without a local support network, unable to work and without a home. For three years, Herb endured homelessness in the downtown east side. And when the COVID-19 pandemic began, Herb was 70 and still unhoused. 
He had been hospitalized five times for pneumonia during the previous winter, and he was scared about what would happen to him without somewhere to stay. He came to First United and got a spot in our emergency shelter. There, he had access to PPE, washing facilities, and a place to isolate if needed. Our staff were able to meet his most basic needs to stay safe and healthy. The shelter was an important stopgap measure that provided Herb exactly what he needed when he needed it. But our staff knew that this wasn't a long-term solution for a vulnerable senior. So our staff worked with Herb to apply for an apartment with our sister organization, First United Church Social Housing Society. In early fall 2020, Herb moved into his apartment, his first safe and private home in over 30 years. This is where Herb has the chance to stay and put down roots. This is his long-term solution, and it wouldn't have been possible without the minimal barrier and basic supports that First United provides, emergency shelter, food, and staff who care. We know this isn't the end of the story, though. We know we must advocate to end homelessness and to push for housing for all, and perhaps even more importantly, to push for true poverty reduction in this province. Herb's story is one of success, but we know there are too many in the downtown east side right now who are not as lucky but deserve just as much. Through our social justice committee, leadership and advocacy, we are committed to continuing the conversation with decision makers to ensure that all our neighbors like Herb don't fall through the cracks. And we are grateful. We could not serve and do this work without the support of you. Every person, business, community of faith, foundation and partner who gives back. Over 50% of our revenue comes from you and we wouldn't be the organization we are today without your help. We are honored you stand with us and we never felt this more than during COVID. The amount of additional support we received, the in-kind donations, in addition to the masks, we had congregations pulling together food hampers for our housing residents that were um, you know, immunocompromised seniors that couldn't get out safely to the grocery stores. The financial support and the emotional support and the people who prayed for us is helping us to get through. So thank you. So I wanna just briefly, because it's AGM time, give a breakdown of our, our financial history for our stump year. Um, one big change in 2020 was the board and um, leadership made the decision to change our fiscal year end from a calendar fiscal year to um, September 30th. And one of the reasons why is over the past uh, 10 years of financial records that we had access to, there have been some pretty significant deficits, some of them planned for investment and growth, and some of them were unplanned. I had the experience in my first year of spending to budget and then our Christmas appeal not going so well and finding out three weeks after a year end that oh, we have an unplanned deficit. And so this puts our major fundraising season in the first quarter of our fiscal year. And so if we have um, any kind of surprise, whether challenging or happy, that uh, we can pivot accordingly and make sure that we're being good stewards of the charitable dollars that we get from our community of supporters. Um, we planned for a $150,000 deficit for the nine month period because of course, January to September, there was no major fundraising season. And we're really thrilled to say that we kept that deficit to just around $30,000. And so we had a better than expected result. Our capacity has also grown. We welcomed four new board members and five new directors for our leadership team. Throughout our tumultuous year, you helped us grow in an organization that will march forward with clarity, determination, and focus for the years ahead, including, uh, it's not, hopefully not a spoiler alert at this point, a redevelopment initiative that is critical to our mission. As we look towards the future, we feel great joy that one day soon, we will be able to gather together and to connect with you in person. I wanted to say um, two special shout outs. The Reverend Jim Hatherley was our Director of Community Ministry. He joined first shortly after me in 2017, and he reached his well-earned retirement last spring, and so uh, retired and moved to the Sunshine Coast to join his partner in March of last year. And um, we're thrilled to uh, welcome Dr. Cheryl Bear as his replacement as our Director of Community Ministry, but Jim has been such a unconditionally loving and calming presence in the downtown east side, known on the street as Pastor Jim. Um, so we're really uh, grateful for his leadership and wish him well in his retirement. And then um, Stan Lanyon finished a almost 10 year term on the board. Uh, the entire time he was serving on the board of First United, he alternated between chair and vice chair. Uh, he finished his uh, last term as chair on June 25th of 2020. and. So we wish him well in his retirement and we're so grateful for the leadership and support that he showed us over the last decade. 
We also can't just reflect on this year without providing some breadcrumbs, little bread pun there, for what's to come. Throughout this challenging year, we've been working behind the scenes to meticulously prepare for our future, which is, includes the redevelopment of our site at 320 East Hastings. In September 2020, we took a leap forward by submitting our develop permit application to the City of Vancouver. Over the course of early December to mid-January, the Urban Design Panel, Vancouver Heritage Commission, and the Vancouver Development Permit Board all unanimously voted to support the application for us to create an 11-story purpose-built building that will provide all of First United's core services, plus new ones, affordable housing, um, and affordable housing in partnership with Luna Native Housing Society. And we're really proud um, of the fact that our plan includes 100% non-market housing. Uh, demolition of the existing church is scheduled to begin sometime summer 2021. So the next uh, two to three years will provide unique challenges as we move our services to satellite locations throughout the downtown east side. I'm joining you from our new administrative offices on Powell Street. Uh, we've got community ministry and community help desk moving this spring and then the shelter and kitchen moving this summer. This project is the future of First United. It will enable us to appropriately address the critical housing, health and social justice needs in the downtown east side. And we hope to connect with you this year to provide more exciting updates and information and how you can help move this project forward with us. Um, so personally, thank you to everybody who has been sharing what they've learned. What I learned is uh, about mindfulness and how to incorporate that more in my daily life. I know there are people on this call who have known me for years and years and years and have seen me, you know, do my PhD in Berkeley while continuing to serve on the board of the World Council of Churches in Geneva while having babies and working full time and saying, you know, Carmen, like you really can't keep this up forever. And I'd just be like, okay, well, just one, like one more sprint, one more street sprint, one day when, you know, one day when my kids are in school or one day when this thing is over at work or one day when my term is over on the general council executive, then I'll slow down. And um, I realized very early on in the pandemic that um, there is no one day when, and all I have is today. And um, I was able to make some different choices around how to best prepare myself to respond to the challenges that the last year had brought rather than always be in a, in a space of reacting. And I have learned to sleep more and to uh, not take my computer home at night and to say, no, I would love to do that. Now is not a good time. Please ask me again. Um, and it has really felt like it slowed down and sped up time more, uh, almost like in a surreal way um, that kept me focused and grounded throughout some really challenging times. And so I'm grateful for that because I'm seeing uh, changed relationships with my staff. I'm seeing changed relationships with my family. And I've made time to read and re-engage with my level of learning. And so it's been a pretty incredible year and a really great learning that way. Uh, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to my friend George, who is our shelter manager, and I will let him introduce himself and his role here. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is George. I, George Flett. I am the shelter manager uh, with, at the First United. I have worked here for a very long time. I started in 2009 as a frontline worker. Um, was lucky enough to get the opportunity to be a supervisor, uh, did a bunch of other jobs. I was a case planner, um, as well as an Indigenous worker, which was great. We did uh, Indigenous programming and uh, eventually was on call, went to get some experience working with youth. And then Carmen uh, came and brought me back to first, where my home is. Um, I'm grateful for it. Thank you, Carmen. Um, yeah, First United, I love it. It's my, it's my home. It's not just my home. Like this is very much my community. Carmen said that there was lots of people who have known her for a long time um, on this call. There are a lot of people in the downtown east side of Nami for a long time. There are people that have literally changed my diapers because <laughs> my family is so embedded into East Vancouver. So I'm honored to do the work that I do and I'm blessed that First United has given me the opportunities that it has. That being said, I honestly wish my job was not needed. Um, it's just an unfortunate uh, a need that we have in today's society, but 
you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm happy to do the work. Uh, First United has grown so much over the years. I, and me along with it. So I'm, I was lucky that way that like, as I, cause I started off when I was quite young, probably mid twenties. And over the last 11, 12 years, I've grown with the church and what all that we do. And we've had programming uh, from storage to uh, karaoke to foot care to all kinds of things. And it's, it's just lovely. Um, the crisis over the last year, uh, I think everybody's felt it in society, regardless if it's if they're working the field or if they're just at home, working from home, not interacting with their families. For us, it was even more hard. Um, Carmen already touched on it, that we we don't like saying no. We are here to help. We are here to do the work, and my team loves helping people. That's what they do. And um, for the first time in a long time, we've had to say no a lot, and it's been a learning curve. It's been tough, but um, we've had a lot of successes too. Um, I, I remember the exact time when me and my boss, um, Keely, uh, sat down. It was like just after lunch, so it was probably like 1 o'clock. And we just made the decision that we had to shut the doors that moment. Um, it didn't feel good, but it felt necessary. And we did that. And um, by attrition, we lowered the number of beds that we have so that we can space people out so that they're not living side by side, one on top of each other, um, being unsafe, given that COVID was so easy to contract. Um, yeah, uh, I think... The successes that we've had as an organization and specifically with my team um, have been that I don't know any cases that we've had transmitted to community, which is amazing. Um, Carmen already talked about having the isolation room. We've ha had to isolate multiple people and, and get them tested and none of them have come back positive, but had they come back positive, we would have had them in a single room rather than beside other people or using the common areas. So I'm really proud and happy about that. Um, I want to share a couple of stories with you uh, that I, off the top of my head. Um, one is a, a young a young man. One of the beautiful things that we do at First United, the reason why one of the reasons why we're so um, important in this community is that a lot of people aren't from the community. They are often um, alienated from their families. Um, either by choice or by force, um, if there's like any legal issues. So they often aren't in contact with their families. And quite often their families do get worried. They don't hear them from the, for a while and they reach out to places like us and look for their either their child, their brother, their father, their mother, their grandchild. And we do our best to help them. Uh, recently I had uh, a young man come to the church who I had actually known for a few years. And it was his um, his ex his ex uh, girlfriend who messaged me and was like, "Hey, I'm looking for um, my ex. Do you, if you see him, can you get a hold of him?" His mother had actually died, and they had no way of getting hold of him. And I was worried because, given that we're not open to the public anymore and people aren't in our doors every single day, we don't get to see people like we used to. Uh, luckily, um, I seen him two days later walking by and I bolted out the door <laughs> uh, like a madman and I was like flagging him down. I, I People probably thought I was a bit crazy and I was like, I need you to come in, I need you to come in. So I, I brought him in, um, allowed him to make that phone call and uh, supported him through that process. Uh, even offered him a bed, um, shower, some clothes, all the kinds of things that we, that we had available. Um, he never stayed with us, but um, obviously, you know, I was happy to do it. Um, the other, the other story I can think of right now is, uh, there was a, a young lady who had come to us. Um, she, I think she was 24, Aboriginal, um, lovely, really a sweet young lady. And she had got attacked by her mother in her housing and her daughter lived with her. And so she had to leave her housing and didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, we took her into the shelter and um, she was really, um, she really wasn't the right fit for us. Um, just given that, uh, you know, she wasn't into drugs, she didn't have any mental health issues. Um, we were, but we worked uh, tirelessly with her for a couple months and were able to get her into uh, modular housing. 
which is uh, not easy to do. And it's really good housing. It's like your own unit rather than an SRO. Um, I just talked to the worker there yesterday and she said that they're actually working on trying to get her into proper housing through native housing where she could actually potentially have her daughter come live with her. So that makes me excited, makes me happy. And that's the kind of work that we really strive to do. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll t uh, the, the opiate crisis has been um, one of the hardest things to deal with uh, pre-COVID and got amplified during COVID because of course um, we weren't allowed to do the things that we'd normally done um, like giving people air and um, doing uh, chest compressions. So, and the, because of that, we actually were told to give the person more naloxone or Narcan um, just because of that to try to get them back. Uh, the problem with that is that if you're giving somebody more Narcan than, than you need to, it's gonna send them into remission um, and, and they will automatically start um, feeling a lot of pain and feel sick. So that's been really, really tough um, to deal with, but my, my team has handled themselves well. We haven't had anybody, I think during the crisis, die on us. So that's amazing and great. Um, but Carmen did mention the fact that there is, I think after 60 seconds or so, um, the potential for brain damage starts. And so like if somebody is overdosed and not breathing for five or 10 minutes before the paramedics get there, it's, it's, it's a scary thought to think. And if it happens over and over and over again, um, the long-term effects, we just don't know. And um, I'm sure will surface in the next few years. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's, probably, that's probably all I got to share today, but I really wanna thank each and every one of you for you know, spending your time to hear us talk and to be a part of First United in your own way. Thank you. Great. Um, so now I'd like to uh, ask you guys to be bold. Um, Amanda was showing me this morning the hypothesis that the bigger the Zoom meeting, the less likely people are to share and talk. Um, so ig ignore that uh, hesitancy and we'd love for you to ask our questions or, or make any comments um, either in the chat box or you can uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself. All right, John, I have a question over there. Um, John Clement from Ladner Delta. Uh, I recall that when Sally McShane was at First United and came to Ladner United as, as First United does that kind of outreach, there was at that time once a week when there was a coffee hour kind of thing. Now, as I listen to George and I get a sharper idea of what's going on day by day, I. I don't see myself volunteering regularly uh, getting in from Ladner, but if there is a chance to come down and, and just sit with people around a table and listen and learn once a week, if there's something like that, I would be interested. That's great to hear, John. Um, so one of the ministries that was running, um, you know, Jim's departure sort of uh, dovetailed with the start of the pandemic and um, Cheryl wasn't able to join us until October, but there was um, what we called a listening ministry. So it was doing exactly that. We had a group of six or seven sort of fairly regular volunteers that would come, not necessarily weekly, but on a regular uh, schedule that worked for them and worked for Jim. And um, we had like blue vests that they would wear and just go and be present to have conversations and join for coffee time. Um, we have second cup in the morning when the drop-in is open and then tea time in the afternoon. Uh, we get a lot of donated pastries through um, a couple of different bakeries in uh, the lower mainland. And so we save that for uh, second cup and tea time. And um, Cheryl, who's on the call uh, on my screen, she's just the writer, but Cheryl Bear is the new director of community ministry. And she would be the, um, the person who will decide uh, if and when we will start that program again. 
Um, and I'll invite her to say something in a second. And then Julia Rutherford is on the call with us today as well. I, I don't see her face, but she's our engagement coordinator, our, our new engagement coordinator. So she will be working with all of the different program managers and directors to coordinate volunteers, um, especially in the new building. I know um, whether intentionally or not, sometimes the message from First United has been like, we don't need you. Like we don't need volunteers. We don't like we, we have our own staff. We're doing our own thing. And um, I know my parents at, at certain times have definitely heard that message um, intentionally or unintentionally. And we want the wider community, both in the church and beyond the church, to know that we value the care and the presence of our community of supporters. And so one of the things we we're really thrilled about is the, in the plans for the new building, we actually built a volunteer break room. And we've built, um, if you've ever been to Our Place Society, uh, in Victoria, which is a, a similar ecumenical shared ministry that's grown into a social service uh, agency. There's a servery on the first floor where congregational and other volunteer groups can come in and serve coffee and oatmeal at all times that the, thing, at the, that the building is open. And so we've built something similar into the ground floor of the new building as well. So there will be opportunities for volunteering um, and, you know, we obviously have to wait until the end of the pandemic to do that in a way that safe on a, on a larger scale. Thank you very much. Um, I'll keep in touch. Yeah. Cheryl, do you want to add anything about the listening ministry? Have you given that some thought? Uh, yeah, we have, um, we have a, a Indigenous um, chaplain now, uh, Lauren Sanders, and we we're talking about having, uh, trying to move the folks into like some wraparound care <clears throat> where they can have not only spiritual direction and spiritual you know, we have services or whatever, but we can also have like counseling and stuff. So I would love to, and, and volunteers, I would love to see um, volunteers coming back because we have such a great, we have historic partnerships with amazing churches in the lower mainland. <clears throat> and there's this great sort of symbiotic relationship that we have with everyone. And I would love to see that uh, happening again. And also just shout out to George. Thanks for doing such a great presentation. I get to see, I get to see right out my door is the um, shelter offices and the shelter resource workers out here. And I think they should all wear capes because they are superhuman there. I'm like, they know everybody's name in, in the community and it's, it is such an amazing thing to see. So thanks George for that really great report. And, uh, and also Carmen. Yeah. Uh, Julie, I see your hand up. Just trying to, yep. Um, yeah. Thanks, Carmen, for the update, and, and George as well. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to congratulate you on 100% non-market housing in your new plan. Uh, I know how difficult that is to do, mm -hmm. and yet that's what we need is we actually need homes for people. You know, the solution to homelessness is actual homes that people can afford. Um, mm -hmm. So just way to go on that. Excellent. L look forward to seeing how it continues on and evolves. Thanks, Julie. A uh, huge shout out to our board for that, too, because I don't think it would surprise anybody to know that that's my personal orientation to preside, provide 100% non-market homes. But it was a really, really, uh, you know, our board had said in the fall of 2018, I think, if it's at all possible, that's our very strong preference. And needing to find a way to do that, um, balancing the long-term financial sustainability and taking care of an 11-story building. And so um, we feel really confident that um, through our partnership with Luma Native Housing that we'll be able to do that. That's good. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Carmen, there was a question in the chat regarding our storage. Oh, yeah. So, storage. Mm -hmm. Um, so our storage program was uh, groundbreaking. I think we were, um, George, George could actually talk about the origins of it better because he was here and I was not. Uh, but I know we were the first place in North America to do it. Um, and it originally started as sharp, shopping cart parking. Um, so if you, if you are experiencing homelessness and you, a shopping cart can be a really easy way to carry around the things that you have with you. Um, but you can't take a shopping cart into a grocery store. You can't take a shopping cart into a doctor's appointment or to a shelter. And so um, we created shopping cart park parking. And then um, once people had a place to shop, to place to store their shopping carts, they didn't need to have a shopping cart anymore. 
So we slowly converted that into bins that could house up to 50 pounds worth of goods that people could use. Um, one of the things that that did is it shaped practice on the Down Honey side. So now most shelters, um, where the, whereas they didn't have storage before, now most shelters are required to have storage facilities. And there are a couple of other organizations that offer um, storage as a possibility. Um, our storage was built on the um, side of the parkade underneath of the church. And it was not fire safe and it was a temporary permit. And we had it renewed a few times, but um, last fall, we knew that the permit was expiring. The current fire inspector had said that they weren't going to renew the permit without some significant fire safety upgrades. And because we knew we were going to be tearing down the building and there was access to storage in other places, we made the decision uh, not to open, um, not to invest that those capital dollars in uh, revising the storage program. And so that's why that was closed last year. And um, one of the things we found out in hindsight is uh, the some of the biggest users who are affected by the, the, um, the closure of the storage program were actually the street vendors. So if you come down Hastings Street, you'll see um, people selling things um, regardless of how they came across them. Um, on the street. And um, so at the end of the day, when our storage was closing, they pack them all up and come and put them back in our storage. And so it's had an impact on the street market for sure, because people don't have a way to keep their things safe overnight. Um, and yeah, I don't know if George, if you want to add anything about that. Yeah, I mean, I can talk for hours about the storage department. I, uh, I, I got to manage the store, storage department near the end, which was great. Um, it, it started, I remember we used to have um, a storage, but it was upstairs where currently we call the gallery is where our men, men are sleeping. And they used to just kind of house bags, random bags in there. And it was a bit of a mess, but I think we got uh, a grant and then ended up, we're able to build out um, a more proper storage down in the parkade with access to the outside. I, I, I am, I was very proud of the storage program, I think, because it was so innovative and because nobody else had it. We got calls from all over North America um, asking us about our practices and how they could implement it within their own um, city, including in Victoria, including in the Kelowna, um, Kamloops, uh, Prince George, all over um, and all the way down to Ohio, just like really everywhere. They were really interested in what we were doing. And um, yeah, obviously being able to give somebody a place to put their stuff if they're vending, or even if they're sleeping outside, right? Like they're they're putting their their sleeping bag in so somewhere so they can actually do something with their day. It, it's huge. So obviously, the community feels a loss, but yeah, there is a lot more storage in other shelters, which is great. Gary and Tim, I saw your hand go up virtually. I think you're muted. Oh, you're okay. muted. Yeah. Oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Um, Carmen, I, I was uh, watching CNN uh, the other day. Don't judge me for that. I like to keep up with what the empire is doing. Um, and I saw this most amazing advertisement for uh, homelessness and food and housing. It was so well done. It was superb. And for only $3 and something a day, you can feed. And they have these incredible pictures. And I thought, who the hell is this? Well, it's Union Gospel down here. And they are uh, producing what would be obviously very expensive uh, commercials for, on CNN of all places. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought, wow, they must be getting that money back and then some in order to do this. But uh, I was so impressed with the quality and what they were saying about homelessness and what they were saying about you know, people's lives being changed and so on, you know, put aside our theological biases and so on. But it was amazing. And I just wonder, has there been any thinking on the board or in staff of looking at that kind of uh, advertising for, for, for the new uh, construction? Yeah, so I'm going to let Amanda uh, speak to that a little bit. We have big plans for when the campaign, uh, our capital campaign goes public. Um, I know, um, uh, so two things, we've added um, 
communications capacity, both in our campaign associate for the capital campaign, as well as we've hired a full-time communication specialist and the new fund development manager um, has significant experience in overseeing that. So I think you'll probably have seen like a real shift in the quality and frequency and diversity of our communications over the past several months of, as we've been building out our fundraising team. UGM, last time I checked, had a fundraising team of over 25 and a full-time videographer, uh, as well as like gra graphic designers and everything on their team. So they do a lot in-house. Um, Jeremy Hunka obviously was a TV personality before he went to be um, the spokesperson for UGM and has a lot of contacts in the press. Um, and so Amanda will talk about what our plans are for the capital campaign and the publicity around that. The thing, um, I haven't even talked to Amanda about this, but the thing that I learned from my, uh, a former workplace is that um, advertising on the big American networks um, as a Canadian charity is actually very, very cost effective. We can advertise cheap, uh, more cost effectively on the American networks and the Canadian networks because they will discount the prices to get the Canadian content, which they have to, they have to get for the licenses to be able to broadcast in Canada. And so, um, and they will often donate the airtime. So it's entirely possible that that airtime was donated. So um, I was watching CNN or MSNBC and I saw a big uh, flashy commercial for EcoJustice, which of course is where I was working before I came to First United. And I called Kim Shear and I was like, how did you, how did you advertise on this American network? And so that's how I learned about that deal. But uh, uh -huh. obviously we want to be, um, making sure we're accessible to people who prefer to watch our strong Canadian networks too. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Amanda for our last couple of seconds to talk about the publicity plans for the capital campaign, which is in its quiet phase, but not secret phase. <laughs> I, yeah, I give, give all of you a little insider scoop and brief. And um, well, spoiler alert, we aren't going to be advertising on CNN, but we do have big plans locally for sure. And just, uh, we will go public with our campaign in the summer when we start demolitioning the building. So as Carmen just mentioned, right now what we're doing is we're trying to shore up capacity and our awareness. I like to say it's not about the money, it's what the money does. And what we're trying to do with our resources is accomplish something together. And in order to accomplish something together, we need to grow out, you know, our community. And keep our community even okay. I don't know whose camera or video that is, but it sounds, sounds fun. Anyhow, there's going to be a lot happening this summer. You're going to see it all over the place. Not just to get money, but to bring awareness. I'm, I'm the moderator. I'm just going to... Oh, I found the person. That never happens. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to turn it back to Carmen. You'll see a lot this summer, if not beforehand. Um, but I appreciate all of you. I'm the director of development here. Uh, and it brings me so much joy to build relationships. Um, to like I said, it's not about the money, it's what the money does. And what we're trying to do right now is live in more just and equitable communities. And so I thank you so much, all of you, every single one of you, um, for your time, care, and attention to the issues down here. Thank you. George, you had your hand up. Did you want to say, did you have like a last thing you wanted to say or was that a mistake? I sent you a message that so I made a mistake of my raising oh, your hand. <laughs> okay, double checking. Didn't want to shut down the staff. Um, yeah, I just echo Amanda's thanks. Um, I'll let you go so we're not too much over time, but thank you all so much for your attendance and for your continued prayers and support of First United. And um, uh, one quick shout out, uh, you, thank you may or may not know on our donate page, we have a give goods page. Um, people are often asking how do we, like other than cash, um, what is it that you're needing? Um, to support First United. That will be shifting somewhat because our storage will be limited during our transition period over the next couple of years while we're not in a big church building. And so um, if you uh, come from a community that collects gifts in kind for us, please keep your eyes on that Give Goods page on our website. Um, there's also a redevelopment page on our website so you can go there for updates about what's happening. So thank you so much for your time and attention and we wish you all the very best blessings. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Happy weekend. Yeah, happy weekend. <laughs>